Work Shop Watch. Here in the museum, we build aeroplanes, restore cars and motorbikes, file, weld, hammer and tap, wonder, weld and plane some more. And they say that where you break an egg, chips fall. And that's what you're going to see here. And off he goes again! Welcome dear aviation lovers to episode number 24 or part 12 on how to build an airplane. The reproduction of the Fokker V40 of 1919 as the Engels E7. In this theater today we cover the spars, we are beveling the spars, build the turtle decks, uncrate boxes, watch Matze build the tank, work out the aileron hinges, drill holes, prepare the assembly of the wings, scare the chickens, pull up the ribs, eat currywurst, glue with aeroducts, assemble our triplane, dress up, give lecture, enjoy life and we honor an old warrior, the Führer's last flight instructor. Building airplanes again. Well, I can't do anything else, and people want to see you anyways. But first, let's make a cup of coffee, because you can't fight without coffee. I can't disagree less. Ah, that wakes you up. Yay! The spars are now prepared to the point where we can cover them. The finishing work that the building inspector wanted was done. Everything clean and sanded and painted on the inside. I don't know if you can see it properly in the camera maybe in the light reflection. I turn it back and forth a few times. The areas that are not coated with glue must be sealed with bolt varnish beforehand. The same applies to the entire inside of the wing spar, of course. After varnishing, everything can now be nailed shut. Once the spars are ready, we can align them and start building the wing. Then we can move forward. Now we have to let it run. Autumn is approaching, the weather is getting cold and, as you know, wood glue and cold don't mix very well. Now the spars are nailed up, with Aerodux 185, of course, as required by the German Federal Aviation Office. In the correct mixing ratio, of course. And stirred well. The stirrer must stir well. 
Kniepampe. Laut Handbuch 10 Minuten ruhen. According to the data sheet, the pamper must then rest for 10 minutes to mature. Yes, then we let it mature before we apply it. It is important to mix the liquid and the powder hardener properly so that no nests of trapped hardener powder remain. Of course, each batch is numbered. The cup is given a number, the component is given a number, etc. Then it goes on. But now, wait for 10 minutes. Ah, uh, I think I get myself a cup of coffee. Hello, it's just me again. The coffee has been drunk and the pot, as it seems, has matured. Bubbling has stopped. What they mean by bubbling is also a mystery to me. Probably the air that is stirred in and comes out at the top, but I haven't seen any explicit bubbling yet. What is this? It has to go. Yo, oh, then we nail again. There are only 4200 nails per airplane. One after the other. At some point. You reach zero. Here you can see a close-up of a scarf joint. This is what the plywood planking of the spar looks like when it covers the spar and the beveled end of the plywood plate overlap to close the spar force fit. In order for the ribs to fit on the wing spars, they must be adapted to the contour. We have already shown this in an earlier episode of the workshop watch, and I don't want to go into it any further here. You can see what I'm doing here. In the meantime, there are many other things that still need to be done to the aircraft. The so-called body wood, the turtle deck which forms the streamlined transition from the round fuselage arches at the front to the angular fuselage cross-section at the rear, still has to be fitted here at the back. 
This must of course be adapted. And this is done with a cardboard template as is usual in body construction. This funny round thing here is the cutout in which the pilot will later have his bag. This is cut out to fit exactly as it will later be made from wood. You then take this template to the woodworking shop. I've already prepared it. You cut out a board, 2mm plywood. This is the first shape for the turtle deck. And we'll see how we build it now in the wood workshop. Because it can't stay that flabby. So lumpig kann es nicht bleiben. Together with the dimensions of the turtle deck, the cardboard template forms the basis for the first cut of the plywood panel. The turtle decks get their stability from wooden strips that are glued on the inside and nailed through on the outside. As already mentioned in episode 10, Wings Bar Making, nails should never be driven in vertically, but always at different angles, so that they interlock in the wood, which means that an outward pull cannot simply pull the nails out. Here, too, we lock everything we can. Component, proof of glue, proof of curing, locks, everything listed in detail. In this case, glued with West Systems resin, as it is not a load-bearing component of the aircraft. Naturally, after consultation with the building inspector and the surveyor. Here it is. The first turtle deck. Finished. It will sit. It will sit on the fuselage like this. So, the covering will come over it later, and this will give the nice transition from the cockpit arch at the front to the flat angular fuselage at the back. Very nice. Now, let's check whether this thing will also fit on the other aircraft. If everything has been built properly. It should. Let's have a look. However, we will turn the camera around for this. So that nobody complains because there might be a cut in the shot. It's a bit complicated when you're on your own. Have to carry the parts, operate the camera yourself and then edit the film at the end. But it is also a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy it. Then let's take a look. When I put it on the back, you can hear the stop. Everything fits beautifully all around. Brilliant. Flawless. I am very satisfied. I can now make the second turtle deck in the workshop using this thing as a template. And this is what I have to do today. Since the turtle deck on serial number 020 fits so well, I might as well use it as a template for 021. And sometimes, as you can see, if you don't buy aviation grade plywood panels, they are much cheaper, but untested and not sorted out. And then it can happen that they have knot holes. So you have to check them yourself. And as it is plywood that always comes in several layers, you also have to x-ray it to see if there are not holes on the inside. Of course, you have to work around these because you don't want them in the component. The turtle decks are not load-bearing but 
only molding parts, shape giving items, but you still want to avoid knot holes. Also wenn man sie doch nehmen will, muss man das Bauteil so darauf platzieren, dass man um diese Astlöcher drum herum arbeitet. Plywood is very stable and from a certain material thickness on it is no longer so easy to adapt it to bends. With the turtle deck it is easier if the doubling in the cockpit area are already laminated in the specified curve. So, and, for die unter euch, die schon immer mal haben, and now for those of you who have always wondered what the inside of a turtle deck looks like, I can show you the first one over here. It's all massively doubled at the front. These short stringers here serve to prevent the thin plywood from giving way and collapsing if someone sits on the back of the fuselage when boarding. Here we have the bearing surfaces for the clamps that attach the whole thing to the transverse frame of the fuselage. And here at the back is the end. That's where the whole thing ends. Looking nice, don't they? Here is the top. The covering fabric will lie over it later. And here sits the pilot with his big bull neck. Number one. And here, number two. The whole thing is now sealed with boat varnish, and when it is dry, it can be finally mounted on the fuselage. This we will see when the time comes. The time has come. This is what the finished turtle deck looks like shortly before it is installed. This forms the back of the fuselage. Incidentally, Fokker has been using this shape since around the middle of 1917. So the triplane was the first that used this in serial production. They are mounted simply by bolting them on. Incidentally, what you often see in replicas of others who work according to the drawings of Walter Redfern or Ron Sands is a substructure made of a bent steel tube around the cutout of the cockpit unit. This was only used by Fokker up to the D5. The sturdy new turtle deck means that this tubular construction can fall away and has also not been used since the triplane. Meaning the triplane already did not have it any longer. We can prove this tube construction on the basis of factory photographs up to the Fokker D5, after which they no longer appear. I think a lot of the new builders were simply afraid that the plywood would not be enough to support their weight when boarding. But it is. Everything on the V40 is simply small and flimsy. It's almost like modeling. Here come the clamps that hold the whole thing down. A clamp is also added at the back to secure the end. Oh, 
And now, the aeroplane has its back. Small aluminum clamps hold the turtle deck down and the wooden support prevents the tension of the covering from pressing into the back. At the front, the turtle deck is bolted to the fuselage structure using welded lugs. This is the whole secret of this component. A parcel has just arrived. The sender was the company of Hutler and Sun Limited in Filling and Schwenningen. In the last episode, you saw how I started to build the control handles. At that time I said, they had to be nickel plated. Now, they are here again. Now we can have a look inside the box. It's always like Christmas. I already had it open, so it was properly packed. Have a look at it. Isn't that nice? It's almost like Kisten and Kisten, a German show by Urlach Entertainment. We only need two of these, but I've made four. One will go into the exhibition, that is the museum. There it will also go on a frame like the hero frames I showed last time. The other two will go into the aeroplanes and I have another handle as a swap object in case anyone is interested. About nickel plating. I can say that Fokker only had nickel plated handles until 1915-ish. Those were the first planes, the M5, M6, M7, M8 and M10. Some of the early reconnaissance planes and the first fighter planes still had nickel plated handles, but later they were simply painted. But we thought that nickel plated handles in the early style would look a bit classier for our little grasshopper. Now we'll add the wooden handles and the blip switch in the center and it will look great. And now Let's see if it fits in the aeroplane. What do you think? Wow! I even freut. Perfect. Fahnemäßig or flag like, my friend Joachim Döring would say. If the wooden handles are on it later, bomb. It's taking shape! Yay! Oh, by jolly! Matze is here! Very rare sight. I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but Matze really enjoys doing benzene tanks. Actually, he doesn't do anything other than petrol tanks here with me. And at the moment, he is working on the tanks for the V40 again. Matze, as a professional petrol tank builder, why don't you tell us something about your work? What are you doing at the moment? Aha, and uh, what are these brackets for? 
Ah, I see. So these are the mounts that will later hold the tank and the fuselage. Fascinating. And look how beautifully he is doing it. As if he had never done anything else and had really learned it. And he learned it. From me. Right, Matze? <laughs> Let's leave him to muddle on alone and just go far away. Maybe down here. All Fokker control surfaces are welded from tubular steel. As far as the suspension and hinges of the ailerons are concerned, we had some thinking to do. I then decided to do something about it. I decided in favor of the version of the hinges that Fokker built for its C4 and C5 fighter aircraft in the mid 1920s. And Martin, for a start, made functional models out of wood. They were then made in steel for the aeroplane. As we have already seen in part 8 of our documentary, the front spar has to be drilled to fit the fuselage and the center cabane struts. We showed this in detail last time, so we won't do that today, but it's the next thing to be done. The front spar goes on there now and is drilled to fit the fittings. I do have to get my son for help, because it's a bit awkward on my own, especially as there are so many aeroplanes around now. The space! The space!
See, the spa is already sitting on the aeroplane. Now it is middled out and drilled to fit. There they stand, the two little grasshoppers. And soon they'll be back on a level playing field. Drilled from both sides and hit the holes exactly. Simply marvelous. You don't necessarily have to have brackets and fixtures to drill holes. A lesson learned is a lesson learned, says the Saxon. Wieder ist ein Tag voll Pracht und wieder ward nur Mist gemacht. Morgen mit demselben Fleiß gehen wir an den gleichen Scheiß. Aber nein, im Ernst. But no, seriously. The day is coming to an end. I've done a lot of work. The ribs are ready, the spars too. All the holes for the fittings have been drilled. Tomorrow I'll start fitting the ribs. But that's it for today. It won't take long for you. Just a few moments and it clicks. The next morning is here and work continues. You see? You can easily cut out a night in a film like this. You didn't have to wait long and the film continues, didn't you? Well, then we open the shop and off we go. True to the motto, the early worm gets eaten, I'm looking forward to a new working day. We will then spend today pushing the ribs onto the spars. Let's see how the weather develops over the next few days. We need a bit of temperature for the clue. Now it's going to be autumn and a bit chilly, but it still looks very promising. 
As long as I can still jump around in short sleeves, the glue will work too. Well, let us tackle the attack. Uh, let's attack it. Uh, let's tackle it. First of all, sort all the ribs, do some minor preparations. Then it's time to get started and turn it into a wing. That's always the best thing. Building wings is one of the best things. Of course, everything about building an aeroplane is interesting, but visually, propellers and wings are delight. First building it, and then sitting there with a bottle of beer in your hand, looking at it. Huh? Confused.com all those rips. Everything we need is here. Well then, Horido. The ribs are first roughly pushed into place. Later they are measured, adjusted and glued in place. But now it's time to get started. Fokker's method of rib construction with these glued on stringers at the top and bottom, the cap strips, was also an ingenious thing. Other manufacturers, and especially many gliders of the interwar years, built the ribs in three parts and glued them to the spars from the front and rear. This is of course a tedious job, and here everything aligns perfectly and the ribs are tightly fitted. Super! I can only say heads off to the people back then. The other, more modern methods also work well of course, but require considerably more effort. High noon, 12 o'clock, lunch time, in a moment. It's a schnuggen fit and a schneisen tight, just as it has to be. You know how it is, no jump, no fight. And you should get hungry again this time while watching. And today we'll have... Gerost mit Pommes, Freibad style. Everybody likes it. 
Here's my blade. Mm -hmm. Nom nom. Nom nom nom. Nom nom. <laughs> Eats like a barnyard eater. So enough of that unhealthy stuff. Now it's time to move on. This funny brown stuff, that's the Aerodux 185. And that's what holds the whole aeroplane together. Should it? The tail goes. Or so they say. Me thinks. One of the great disadvantages of the Aerodux is its advantage. And that is the color. The red-brown color allows the person applying the adhesive to check whether the adhesive has actually been applied. And of course, it makes it easier for the building inspector to check. Many aeroplane builders certainly have to be checked, as the aim is to eliminate natural selection. Taxpayers are important capital investments, keep that in mind. But there are actually aircraft builders who have no sense at all of where the clue should actually go. Have it on their fingers, touch the next component and smear everything. It then looks like a mess. I have seen wooden wings. Terrible. They hold, but they are ugly. Dogs. So, first everything is smeared with the Aerodux, then the parts are nailed on. After nailing, you can also wipe off the Aerodux that has oozed out. You can then press it on again with the center punch, wipe it off again and it actually looks relatively nice. I would not recommend wiping the stuff away with your finger, a cloth or even a brush. There are building inspectors who value a nice little caterpillar that may look nice, but I don't want it. I take a small piece of plywood and scrape it off, then it looks acceptable. Acceptable. The only thing you shouldn't do is smear the reddish stuff, otherwise the plane will look like it's been in a sword fight and is now covered and smeared in blood from top to bottom. Extremely ugly.
And with that, let's leave the construction of the V40 for today. We do other things here as well and you might find it interesting to see how we assemble the triplane for an open Saturday in my museum. We do this once or twice a year depending on the weather. We don't have the funds for a roof so that we can build a proper museum and display the aeroplanes permanently assembled. Fokker aeroplanes are very cleverly designed and can be quickly put together and made ready to fly. For this event we will not uh, adjust everything and we will not secure all the screws or bolt everything down because we have to dismantle it again in the evening. But you can imagine how these aircraft were assembled in the field. So the assembly takes about 30 minutes with measuring and tightening and securing all nuts a maximum of 1.5 hours. Then the plane is ready for combat. I'll let you listen to some contemporary music from 1917 in the background. You can then hear what the workers at Fokker used to listen to when they plugged on their MP3 players in the factory. Not bad either.
My goodness, it's already late. It's late. And because it's late, we're calling it a day with the workshop watch now. But there's one more thing I want to show you. This is Daniel. And Daniel is standing guard today. He's standing guard at the triplane, which we set up. I want you to be able to see what it is like when my little museum is open on the first Saturday of the month. We'll dress up a bit then. It's not quite up to date, I admit, it's more mid-twenties, early thirties, but the style still fits in with the First World War. That's how we then jump around here. Not all of us, but some of us. Then visitors come and look and marvel. And now you can see what it looks like. And you'll have fun in your uniform today too. The sun is shining, I'm already sweating in my light shirt and bow tie. Oh. Visitors can of course ask questions and someone has to answer these questions. That's usually me if it's about aviation history or aircraft technology. It looks like this then. I talk, talk, talk and people nod their heads in rapt attention. Most of them always find it really interesting. I am not the only one who has a clue and others can also explain things well. My friend Joachim Döring, for example, also explains a lot to visitors. We are also all wonderfully catered for in the museum. There's wine and cake and much more. You can sit and have a good time in a family atmosphere. The V40 also is one of the main attractions here in the museum. And we can tell a lot about it. People can also touch it and understand things better. We are a museum to take hold of things. Things however can not only be touched here, but can also be tried out. Here Joachim is riding one of our vintage light motorbikes. He is certainly having a blast. Any questions of any item that is shown in the exhibition room are answered of course also. Every Saturday is different. This time the main attraction of course was the assembled triplane. And this time we had a special visitor. Walter Höflinger, the Führer's last living flying instructor, born in 1924. He was here once and said if he makes the 100, he wish to sit in the triplane like his former idol Manfred von Richthofen did. We fulfilled his wish and set him into the triplane. The triplane made in 1917, the old eagle born in 1924, meeting of generations. That is a couple you don't see very often. Crazy. Once he said he wanted to sit where Manfred von Richthofen sat, or at least see what he saw when he was sitting in his triplane. His wish was granted and he was happy. His grandson and his daughter and all his flying pals helped him in. 
He could see that memories came up in him. Lauf nur durch, tust du tust dem Foto nicht weh. Ja, weiß ich nicht, hab nix gesehen. Ich glaub vor dem Flugzeug oder so. Ein Schweißekasten? Ah ja, so. Wird schon nicht leben, leider. Kann ich doch. Achso, schau laufen lassen. Ja. Achso, auf dem Stuhl. Ja. Hast du da Tag so was? Ja. Ja. Aber er auch nicht. Nein. Was? 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 So hat's dir gefallen. Hat's dir gefallen? Was hat's dir gefallen? Ob's dir gefallen hat? Ja, feine. Feine. Ja, aber feine haben wir vorhin gesehen. Und das war sie auch schon wieder, die Werkstattschau des Museums für Flugzeugbau und Technische Geschichte in Weschenbeuren. Besuchen Sie uns doch mal. Jeden ersten Samstag im Monat von 9 bis 18 Uhr geöffnet. Museum für Flugzeugbau und Technische Geschichte in Weschenbeuren. Wir freuen uns auf Ihren Besuch. <lacht> <lacht>